Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's webinar. Um, my name is Neil Scrimger. I'm the senior scientist at the AWRI, uh, working in the commercial services group. Today's webinar is the influence of different closure technologies and oxygen management techniques on wine shelf life. So um, the webinar will run for approximately 30 minutes and then we'll have a Q&A at the end. If you wish to make a note of any questions that pop up as I go through the slides, feel free to do that as we go along and then I'll work through those at the end. Okay, so as, as the title suggests, there's two elements to this presentation. During the first half, I'll talk about oxygen management during bottling and why that's particularly important. And the second half, I'll talk about different closure technologies that are available commercially, and I'll show some of the trial data that um, the AWRI has generated over the years, as well as some other external data as well. So both of these elements have the potential to significantly affect wine development and shelf life. And the majority of what I'm going to talk about today um, is in relation to the impact of oxygen. There are obviously other aspects, um, particularly in relation to the impact of the closure, but most of what I talk about today will um, refer in some way to the impact of oxygen. So there's obviously many areas of the winemaking process where oxygen can be a factor, um, particularly during crushing, fermentation, and if you're particularly interested in information around those areas of the process, I would refer you to some of Martin Day's recent work over the last few years. Um, the focus of this morning, though, will be predominantly on the bottling and ageing processes. Uh, just before I move on, this is an extract from a paper. Um, again, this is from some of the work that Martin Day's um, researched and it just shows some of the impact of different winemaking processes on dissolved oxygen contents in wine. So you can see there's quite a broad range of um, impacts depending on what the, the process or the operation is. Um, RDV filtration um, can be particularly um, influential in terms of introducing oxygen into the process. Um, also things like cold stab as well. And obviously bottling process itself can be particularly significant, especially with something like bagging box. Now I'm not going to go into chemistry too deeply this morning. I think it is useful to understand the role that oxygen plays, especially in um, SO2 depletion. There's a common uh, misconception that one milligram of oxygen will react directly with four milligrams per litre SO2 in wine. So the more oxygen that makes its way into the into the bottle, um, there's a direct reduction in SO2. Um, oxygen doesn't actually react with SO2. Uh, the actual chemistry behind the processes involved are fairly complex and are actually still being researched and debated. So ignore that. Um, that, that is a reasonable rule of thumb, but it's not quite as straightforward as, um, as it being a 4 to 1 ratio. The reality is that phenolics uh, such as catechols are present in wine react to form quinones and peroxide. And it's, it's this peroxide over here that reacts with the SO2, which is um, predominantly in the bisulfite form. And the quinone that's formed may react with another molecule of bisulfite, but it depends on the reactivity of that quinone. It also depends on other phenolics that are present in the wine. So with something like reds where there are more phenolics, um, the quinones may react preferentially with some of those other components. And that drives that ratio down. So in theory, uh, one to two moles of SO2 can ind indirectly react with one mole of oxygen and that equates to two to four milligrams per litre SO2 reduction for every milligram per litre 
oxygen introduced. So the ratio can be as high as four, but it can be as low as two. So moving on to oxygen uh, bottling, there's a number of key points in the process where oxygen can be introduced, and I've highlighted some of these here. It's obviously, the, the oxygen in the wine that's dissolved to start with. Uh, we can pick up oxygen on transfer from the bottling tanks into the filler head. Um, most lines will employ filtration um, during that process. So again, we can see some oxygen pickup through there. We can see oxygen pickup in the filler bowl itself. And again, it depends on the particular operation and how well the um, oxygen is um, removed from the filler bowl during filling. Uh, that level obviously moves up and down as the process goes. Uh, Pre-flushing used on bottles tends to involve other nitrogen or CO2, but the efficiency of that process can also impact on how much oxygen is residually left in the bottle prior to filling. And now we have things like a headspace or um, headspace and a cap purge if we're talking about screw caps, uh, where we can potentially um, have oxygen entrained. Um, and again, some of the better bottling lines are pretty efficient in removing the oxygen from those points in the process. Historically, there's been little focus on the headspace that's in the bottle. So this is typically what we see um, when we look at the proportion of how much oxygen is dissolved into the wine and how much is in the headspace. So this data is taken from a, a benchmarking study that was carried out, I think, around 2010. And it really highlighted the importance of headspace oxygen in total package oxygen, or TPO. As it's known, um, you can see from the graph that in pretty much every case, the headspace oxygen dominates the TPO. And there's quite a broad range of TPO levels um, from below one milligram per litre TPO um, up as high as um, seven, uh, which is which is very very significant. Uh, at the AWRI, I think we'd consider TPO of less than 2.5 milligrams per litre to be reasonably good practice, uh, and that's that's consistent with what I've personally seen in a number of bottling lines across industry. In terms of these two components, the TPO, we can measure both. Uh, we normally employ uh, what's called the Nomasense optical sensing technology. Um, that process involves fixing oxygen sensitive spots into bottles, and then that oxygen spot is illuminated with a blue LED light, uh, which then emits a signal intensity that's proportional to the oxygen concentration around the spot. So typically with bottling line um, performance assessments that we might do, we would have a spot sitting in the bottle here, which is obviously reading the dissolved oxygen in the wine, and a spot somewhere up the top of the bottle that um, measures the headspace oxygen. And we use this type of technology to gain a better understanding of bottling line processes and to understand where the oxygen hotspots are in the process. Um, and we can also use that to support engineer improvements designed to reduce TPO. So we can see uh, this is a typical example of what we might see from a, a bottom line audit. Um, majority of the oxygen in the process is sitting in the headspace. Uh, there's generally a um, five to 10% that resides in the wine itself as DO, and then a proportion that's picked up through the, the filling process. Um, the amount that's picked up through the filling can be more significant than this, but it depends on the individual operational setup and how um, you know, gases are used. So these are the hotspots we, we typically see in the process. So I'll just um, quickly run through these and talk about what drives the oxygen pickup at each point. Um, I've talked about the DO. I think um, a lot of people would generally use inert gas cover in their bottling tanks before the bottling process occurs, but how efficiently that's um, carried out 
can, can impact on how much DO ends up in the wine. Uh, there's a number of processes during transfer where oxygen can be picked up. Um, that can depend on what type of filtration technology is being used, what type of pumps are being used. Um, prior to fill, I've talked about gas cover in the filler bowl being significant. Significant. The temperature of the wine itself can obviously play a part. Um, the lower the temperature of the wine, the greater um, the amount of oxygen that can be dissolved into the wine. And the, the pre-fill purge that's used on the bottles and what gas mix, um, what, which gases are used in that process can be significant. The fill height's obviously important. Um, the greater the fill height, the greater the potential for oxygen um, sitting in the headspace to be more significant. And don't under, underestimate the impact of constant line stoppages and line configurations where there's a long distance between the fill and application of the closure, for instance, can be significant uh, because any attempts to drive oxygen out of the headspace prior to the closure can be completely lost if, if that distance is particularly long. So why is this important? Well, we, we know that TPO can have a big impact on the shelf life of the wine. This, this data is taken from a, a commercial study um, that we carried out for a, an individual closure supplier. And we looked at the impact of different TPO levels on shelf life and what proportion of total oxygen exposure was due to TPO and what proportion was due to the OTR of the closure itself. You can see when the TPO is low, um, such as the top row here, um, the total oxygen exposure from that is, is less than 10%. We have a reasonable shelf life, 27 months. But when the TPO is high, um, in this case it was 5 milligrams um, per litre, it tends to dominate the oxygen exposure. So in this case it accounts for 70% of the total oxygen um, that's picked up in the process. And that, that ends up with us having a, a shelf life um, projected of around six months, which is obviously very short. Um, contribution from OTR becomes much less important when the TPO is at levels such as, such as these during bottling. So this is data taken from another study, just showing this graphically. Um, I've just highlighted the uh, what's typically accepted to be a, a good shelf life indicator, which is free SO2 levels, uh, 10 milligrams per litre. So you can see when the TPO at bottling is in the, in the region of 5 milligrams per litre, um, we're dropping below that line within about six months. And when it's higher, it obviously takes much longer to reach that, um, that threshold. So typically we would see bottling lines performing somewhere in between these two. Um, certainly if you're at the lower end and you're achieving something like a TPO of one milligram per litre, then you would expect that to have minimal impact on shelf life and development. But it's certainly if it's up towards three, four, five milligrams per litre, it can be much more influential. So now I'll move on to looking at the second aspect of, of wine development and um, where oxygen can play a part and that, that's in the closure itself. There's obviously many different types available in the marketplace, um, many different natural cork suppliers. Uh, agglomerates or what's more broadly known as technical cork products. There's now a number of glass-based um, closure products that are um, available commercially or being developed as we speak. Obviously the screw caps with different liners and there's a number of different synthetics on the market as well. So there's a wide range of suppliers out there. Each of the closures has its own pros and cons depending on how you would like the wines to develop underneath them. So the benchmarking of closures started for us back in about 99 um, and it was a groundbreaking study and then it put uh, a range of 14 different closures through their paces. Um, so we looked at a series of physical, chemical and sensory tests applied to a semi on wine under 14 different closures 
Uh, this picture is taken at 28 months post bottling, but that actual trial ran for three to four years. And that study, it's worth saying at this point, was funded at the time uh, as a research project, so through GWRDC. Um, now we tend to find that most closure trials are funded commercially. It's not an area that is um, is attracting research funding or has uh, potential for attracting research funding. So most are funded commercially, which means that most of the data that's generated from those trials tends to be commercially in confidence. But um, that 99 trial was one of the first studies to highlight the impact that closures can have on wine development. Uh, this radar plot's taken from the 36 month point and it shows the clear benefits that screw caps can have in preserving the SO2, uh, but also um, maintaining some of those fruity characters, citrus and lime characters in this particular case. It also highlighted some of the negatives of uh, cork-based products and synthetics. Um, with corks, it was more an issue of var variability, um, but we also saw evidence of low SO2 on the corks and synthetics and generation of oxidative characteristics. It's also one of the first studies to recognise the development of um, struck flints or rubber um, attributes developing on the screw caps um, due to volatile sulfur compounds and I'll talk a bit more about this shortly. So OTR is obviously one of the most important attributes of a closure uh, typically measured in cubic centimetres of oxygen or air per day. Um, this is just an indication of the sort of range you can get with different closures. Uh, it is fairly broad, so at the left hand end we've got screw caps. Um, OTR for those is, is obviously dependent on the liner. Uh, industry is almost completely dominated by those two that I've shown there, sarin tin and sarin X. Sarin tin with a slightly better oxygen um, barrier than the sarin X. Uh, over on the right hand side we have the natural corks and synthetics that have generally higher OTRs and technical corks, um, some of the other synthetics will sit somewhere in the middle. Um, one of the benefits of technical corks or glomerates that we typically see is um, very consistent um, and much lower variability than natural corks. So ITR is driven by the difference in oxygen concentration between the headspace in the bottle and the concentration external to the bottle. So as oxygen present at bottling inside the bottle dissolves and reacts, the concentration internally will decrease and that drives oxygen diffusion through the closure and the mechanism of that is very dependent on the type of closure and materials involved. Um, but we can measure OTR in two, um, two different ways. Uh, the first is what we call a, the dry state where we typically have an empty bottle filled with an inert gas and we have a, an oxygen sensor spot in that bottle um, and through that spot we monitor, monitor oxygen increase through the closure. The, the second form is in what we call the wet state, so the bottle is filled with wine and typically we get wine from, from a bottling line and we use um, some sort of impermeable container to encapsulate either the bottle or the closure um, and measure O2 depletion. Um, this here is more indicative of today's set that we actually enclose just the top of the bottle and the closure itself and at the start of the process this area around the, the closure is full of oxygen and we monitor the depletion of oxygen as it enters the bottle line. Typically we see very similar values from both methods, from the dry and the wet method. So I know that the presence of the wine can have an impact, but typically it's a minimal impact on, on what we measure as the OTR through the closure. The only caveat I'd add to that is if storage is not vertical, as shown in this case, but is horizontal. So when we get liquid contact with 
vesicular closures um, such as cork or EVRH based closures, um, then that can influence the change in the OTR. Uh, we use this type of technology for screening um, whether or not we've got effective closure application um, and general troubleshooting. To highlight the importance of OTR, um, I've just shown a typical trend graph. This is for free sulfur dioxide during storing and aging. We typically see an initial drop um, during those first three months. And it's typically from the TPO that's introduced at the bottling. Once that oxygen that was present from bottling is um, dissipated into the wine, the OTR takes over. And this is a common trend we see in sulfur depletion curves, typically corks and synthetics losing more than screw caps. During the early stages of aging, most of the oxygen entering the bottle reacts indirectly with the free sulfur dioxide. But then during the latter stages, we tend to see the apparent loss declining and plateauing out. It appears that this is derived, um, the acetone that is derived so the SO2 that's involved in those reactions is derived from the bound form. So um, because the bound is in equi equilibrium with the free form, it allows small amounts of the free sulfur dioxide to sub subsequently react. So the, the free SO2 curve doesn't change particularly during the last stages of aging, but the, the bound SO2 graph can continue to change and has a downward trajectory. This is a typical PCR plot from a closure study. Um, I won't go into all the detail on this, but it, it kind of shows the attributes that are driving some of the differences we see in wines through chemical and sensory. So we can see core closures such as the natural cork here being associated with some of these cooked fruit, bruised apple, um, oxidized characteristics. Um, and they generally, those closures relate to um, free, uh, free and total SO2 levels that are lower. And then we've got the screw caps up here which are normally associated with higher levels of free and total sulfur. Um, generally higher colour density, things like that are seen more under cork. And some of these characteristics like H2S, um, rubber, reduced characters t can be associated with some of the screw caps and some of the screw cap liners depends a little on the wine style. So quickly just to finish off, I'm going to talk a bit about the sulfur chemistry. So these are the compounds that are responsible for some of the sensory differences that we see in closure trials and, and particularly those negative attributes. It's a very complex area of wine chemistry. It's still the subject of ongoing research. If you're particularly interested in this, I'd refer you to the work of Eric Wilkes and Miley Becker who um, have published a lot of information on this. These are the uh, volatile sulfur compounds we typically see in wine. Um, there's a number of different ones that we could potentially see. The most important three I've highlighted in red here for you. So these are compounds that have low molecular weights. They're relatively volatile typically detected in very small amounts by the nose, so they have a very low odour threshold. This is a very simplified reaction scheme outlining how these compounds are interrelated in wine. So an important point to note is that the balance between the oxidised sulphur compounds, I've got here in the bottom left, um, which have a lower, lower sensory impact and therefore higher, higher sensory threshold. The, the, the balance between those and the thiols, which are in the center, which have a, a lower sensory threshold, um, is reversible. And that process is dependent on the amount of available oxygen, also the pH and the presence of some metals as well. So even when compounds are present in their oxidized form, a change in conditions for that bottle of wine can drive reformation of some of the more potent sulfur compounds and they can obviously impact negatively on wine aroma if the sensory thresholds are particularly low as would be in the case with 
um, hydrogen sulfide or the thiols. In numerous closure trials, it's shown that DMS, dimethyl sulfide, has been a dominant sulfur-containing compound. Um, levels of this typically approaching the aroma threshold, which are 20-25 micrograms per litre after just one year in bottle. I'll talk a bit about that um, as well as show you some graphs and some of the other sulfur-containing compounds. So both H2S and methane thiol do appear to be influenced um, by the closure. They, they tend to be influenced more by the period of time that the trial is undertaken on, um, but we do see some differences um, under different closures um, depending on the wine matrix uh, and depending on what point in time we do the analysis. Um, these graphs are taken over a three-year period for separate trials, one involving a white wine, one involving a red wine, um, under different types of closures. You can see the, the H2S in these um, instances is changing quite erratically in some cases. Um, we often see a change in trajectory once you get beyond that three to six month point. So when, once the bottling oxygen has been consumed and done its damage, um, we then see a generation of other trends. Uh, but very often it's not a linear process. We don't see linear increases in these compounds. Levels tend to rise and fall at different times. And again, similar picture for methane thiol. Um, trajectory changes depending on the wine style. And at what point in time um, we undertake the analysis. And sometimes, as you can see, that in case of the red wine trial, there are some changes in methane thiol, but it's all below the sensory threshold area, which is up, up here. Um, for the white wine, we, we do see methane thiol having an influence on the sensory attributes, especially beyond the TU point. Um, and to my knowledge, this trajectory has increased um, up to four years, five years in bottle. Um, and obviously, that at those sort of levels, the, the sulfur-containing compound can be much more significant on the aroma that is detected through sensory. And like I said, it's a similar story for DMS, erratic changes over time. Uh, we still don't fully understand exactly why we're seeing these shifts, but we're starting to get a better understanding of some of the drivers that are influencing these reactions. We know in the case of DMS, these changes do appear to be indirectly related to the rate of oxygen ingress through the closure. And here's just a graphical representation of that. So this shows the interdependence of SO2, um, sorry, the relationship between the DMS and the loss of free SO2 between six month and the 36 month time point. Um, obviously during the first three to six months, as I've said, the TPO can play more of a role. Um, once we get more towards an anoxic environment underneath the closure, then we see um, a more direct relationship between the amount of oxygen that's entering the closure or entering through the closure and the amount of corresponding free SO2 that's lost because of that and a relationship between that and the DMS that's formed. So as I said, we don't know the full details of the chemistry that's going on, but we obviously know that oxygen is playing a big role in this process. Finally, just a note on some of the other closure attributes, just to bear in mind when you're looking at selecting particular closures for your wines. Tainting and scalping can be an issue, um, especially with plastic-based closures. Um, scalping is essentially where volatiles are removed from the wine, and tainting is, is obviously when compounds that are present in the closure potentially leach out into the wine. That's more likely to be the case when the wine and the closure are in contact, so when the wine's stored horizontally, but scalping can occur when the wine's stored stored vertically. Um, and we often do tests, with, especially with prototype closures, um, to, to make sure that the materials that are being used in closures that make their way to the commercial arena are, are fit for purpose. Extraction and removal, um, obviously with screw cap, we look at things like torque, but cylindrical based closures, it's more aspects like vertical force to remove the, the closure from the bottle. 
And we also look at how well closures stand up against the rigors of shipping and transportation. One of the big factors in there is how well they stand up to temperature variations. Uh, and so through through these types of analyses, we start to build up a picture of how closures perform against others. Uh, and this allows us to get a broad indication of where some of the pros and cons are with respect to different closure types. Obviously, some are, are more um, susceptible to tainting and scalping. As I said, some of the more plastic-based closures tend to show those sort of trends. Uh, OTR uh, really depends on what you're looking for for your wine. There's a broad range of closures that will allow you to achieve quite a broad range of OTR. Understanding how that impacts on your particular wine, your particular wine style is, is important. Uh, and obviously we, um, we consider all of these aspects in conjunction with the, the chemical impacts on the wine and what the sensory um, impact is. So what are, what's the impacts on some of those aroma attributes and the palate. So quickly take home messages. Oxygen introduced a bottling and it's predominantly where I'm talking about TPO can have a big effect on shelf life, especially when those levels are certainly up towards uh, four or five milligrams per litre. You would expect that amount of oxygen to have a, a big impact on what's happening with your wine down the track. Most of that TPO does tend to come from the headspace. So if you have any ability to influence what happens during the bottling and to look at things like uh, post fill headspace purge uh, with screw caps that would include a cap purge as well that will bring that headspace oxygen contribution down. OTR of the closure tends to be the dominant factor in how wines develop. Assuming that your TPR bottling is not particularly high, OTR is normally the thing that dominates that process and defines how the wines will develop over time. The prominence and how influential some of those volatile sulfur comp compounds can be, especially on the aroma profile of wines, is very dependent on wine matrix. So I've, I've shown you examples of both white wine and red wine trials that we've carried out at the AWRI. Um, work we've done with other suppliers that I haven't shown has shown we changed the wine matrix. The, the prominence of those VSCs can change drastically under exactly the same closure uh, across exactly the same timeline. So it's very dependent on the matrix of the wine, um, but those, those volatile sulfur compounds can be very influential once they get beyond that sensory threshold. And just a final note that there are obviously other factors to consider when you're looking at closure choice. The phys physical integrity of the closure, how well it performs under the rigors of um, shipping, transportation, and elevated temperatures are particularly important. Um, with things like sparkling wine, it might be how well the, the CO2 um, is retained. Um, so there are other factors at play. But um, these are the key things to consider when you're looking at the, the impact of oxygen, both from the bottling process and from the, the closure itself. So that concludes the formal presentation. So um, now we're moving to the Q&A. So there's two different ways to ask a question. Um, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you can type out a question um, if you'd like to do do that or you can press the, the raise hand button which looks like this and um, if you've got a microphone you can use the raise hand button I can then unmute your microphone and you can ask the question directly or you can type out the question and I'll answer it that way. So I can see there is a question from Richard Gibson um, so Rich is asking if we have data on the OTR of vertical storage for cork versus laid down cork um, for the same product. Um, 
Thanks for the question, Richard. The, the short answer is yes, we do. I, I don't have any slides today to show you what those differences are. Um, I know that the the nature of the cork, i.e. is it natural or is it a technical cork, um, will have an impact on how the OTR is um, impacted by, by the vertical versus horizontal. Um, generally, we see, uh, if anything, a, a slight lowering in OTR when it's laid down, um, when the cork's uh, so in the bottle with a cork in is standing vertically, it tends to dry out. So there's um, higher propensity for oxygen to diffuse through the corks. That whole mechanism is still under um, a fair bit of um, debate, and there's a lot of research going on on the mechanisms of oxygen diffusion through corks. Um, so there's not a straight answer to that one, but um, if anyone is particularly interested in that data that Richard's referring to, please send me an email and I can send that directly to you. I've also got a um, question from Jean McIntyre. So Jean's asking, what would we recommend to measure TPO in sparkling wines in a production environment? Uh, again, thanks for the question, Jean. Um, with the sparkling closure trial that we initiated back, in, back at the end of 2014, we actually did measure TPO during bottling um, in the third party environment. Um, that was actually using the Nomasense technology um, or combination between that to measure the headspace oxygen and using the laboratory um, instrumentation that was available to, to measure the dissolved oxygen in the wine. So. In, in theory, you can measure TPO in the same way in sparkling wines as you can with still wines. Um, one thing I didn't mention was with the Nomasense technology, you do need a clear or Arctic blue bottle. So if you're working with um, dark green, that becomes more of an issue. Uh, we are constantly looking at other technologies that are available that allow us to measure TPO more effectively. Um, and that, that's pretty much an ongoing process for us. But yeah, the short answer is similar technology for sparkling wines. Okay, I've got another question from Jeff Broadfield. Jeff's asking what level of dissolved oxygen is recommended in white wine immediately before bottling? Um, thanks for the question, Jeff. That is, that's a good question. It's very dependent on the wine style. Um, obviously, the lower, the better is the short answer. Um, again, I, I talked about good practice with TPO being anything less than two and a half milligrams per litre. I think with DO in wine, we'd normally look at anything below 0 0.2, 0 0.3 milligrams, milligrams per litre to be um, good practice or best practice. Um, so if you can get levels down to around that sort of figure, um, then you're doing pretty well. Um, anything beyond that, has the potential to um, significantly influence the development of that wine. And obviously, the more delicate the, the wine style, the more important that dissolved oxygen is. Uh, another question from Sean LaFranco. And Sean's asking, what type of equipment and approximate cost to measure o OTR and TPO? So the, the total package oxygen technology we use um, isn't particularly cheap. Those sort of units, um, the Nomasense technology, um, typically in the region of ten to $15,000. So you know, bigger bottom lines um, would typically have that type, sort of technology, as do we. But for smaller operators, that's probably cost prohibitive. Um, OTR obviously utilizes the same technology, but the, the cost of actually undertaking the, the analysis is, um, is actually much, much lower. So we tend to find that people would use um, AWRI or other service providers to actually undertake that analysis. If TPO is particularly um, an issue for your bottling line or your, your operation, uh, I believe there are options to, to hire that type of equipment. 
or the AWRI um, can be engaged to to undertake um, a third party audit of the line to, to give you a better understanding of uh, where some of those hotspots are. I've got another question from Richard um, asking me to comment on the impact of SO2 on shelf life um, in terms of maintaining high levels of bottling and packs with high OTR. Um, so I'm just trying to get my head around what he's asking me. <clears throat> uh, I might just ask Richard to retype his question so I've got a better understanding of exactly what he's asking, but the the impact of SO2 on the bagging box um, because the oxygen levels tend to be a fair bit higher would be much more significant. Um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, Richard, but if not, please, please have another go at, at typing that. Um, Severin Logan has asked where we can get the TPO calculator formula. There is actually um, something that's available on our website. So again, if, if anyone's interested in the TPO calculator, I can send you a link to that. Um, there is a method by which you can get a reasonable approximation of TPO through doing uh, dissolved oxygen readings, both unshaken, both, both on unshaken and shaken samples. Uh, and it gives a reasonable approximation of, of what the TPO is without the need for the expensive technology. So if anyone does want a copy of that, then they, um, they can send me an email. I can send you a link to that. Got a question from Vanessa Stockdale. Um, do we have any recommendations for reducing oxygen in headspace? Uh, I'm not sure if that's from Vanessa or Don Bruce, but um, oxygen in headspace at bottling can be addressed in a number of different ways. Um, obviously, the the pre purge, um, sorry, the pre fill purge that's carried out on the bottle, the the type of gas that's used on that, and the the pressures that are used with um, what's generally either nitrogen or CO2 can be influential on how much oxygen is purged from the bottle pre-fill. Obviously, the performance of the filling heads can also influence the, um, the amount of headspace oxygen. And then there's, there's a number of different ways to, to undertake the post-fill headspace purge, uh, normally introduced through a nitrogen or CO2 um, shot into the headspace as it passes under nozzles um, and that's reasonably or can be reasonably effective at reducing headspace oxygen. Uh, and don't forget if you're using screw caps, having a cap purge prior to application can be very um, effective as well. Okay, Richard Gibson's um, got back to me again on that earlier question. Uh, he's commented that shelf life can be extended when it's known that OTR is high by using higher SO2 levels at filling. Uh, yep, Rich is making a very good comment. Um, I haven't really talked about typical SO2 levels, but obviously if you expect that OTR will be high, and it's particularly the case with bagging box, um, then you can um, preempt the, the effects of that by having higher amounts of sulfur dioxide in the wine. Um, I've also got a question again from Jeff Broadfield. Is spudging wine with nitrogen to lower dissolved oxygen in road transported wine at pre-bottling effective and does it have any deleterious effect on the wine? So spudging with nitrogen to lower DO in road transporting wine, yeah that process um, is used a fair bit to my knowledge. Um, If that's uh, a question around what impact the road transportation might have had on the wine chemistry, um, the short answer is that during that transfer, <clears throat> there's obviously a fair uh, 
um, opportunity for oxygen to be introduced into the wine. So obviously if it arrives at its point of um, point of bottling with high DO level, and you can use nitrogen sparge to, to lower that DO, what effect and what impact that oxygen that's been introduced into, into the wine has had during the road transportation itself and how that might affect the longer term development of the wine. Um, obviously I can't answer that question directly, it depends on the wine style but it can certainly have an impact. Uh, so even if you lower that level of bottling, some of the damage may already have been done. Okay, I can see I've got a raised hand from Sean, and Sean, I'll just unmute your microphone so you should be able to ask your question directly if I haven't already asked it. Are you there, Sean? Okay, he's just saying he, he clicked on that by accident, that's fine. Okay, I'll just give it another minute or so for anyone to ask any more questions I might have. Just just while I'm waiting, uh, just a comment, this is the, the last webinar in the current series. So there's no more planned for uh, the next, certainly in the next few weeks. Uh, we are in the process of looking at the schedule for the next series, which is due to start around August time. So I'll keep We'll keep you posted on um, developments there. Okay, Sean LaFranco has got back to me with another question asking what the recommendation is for free SO2 in premium red wines on the screw cap. Um, Sean, that's <laughs> somewhat of a loaded question. It's very difficult to give you exact figures on what the appropriate SO2 levels should be for a particular wine or particular style, um, even under a um, particular closure because it really depends on what that wine is, what the style of it is, um, how much, um, how many phenolics are in the wine, that, that will all have an impact on how that SO2 develops. I mean typically for something like screw cap obviously um, assuming the bottling of that product is carried out reasonably efficiently um, there will be um, a minimal impact from either TPO or OTR, certainly in the short term, and certainly for a premium wine, I would expect there to be no real positive um, or influential impact for the first sort of couple of years of storage. Um, I would be particularly trying to get an understanding of how reductive characters might develop for a premium red under screw cap. Um, that you know, obviously is an increasing trend for people to put longer cellaring reds under screw cap. Uh, the issue of reductive char characters developing is still there, but it's more around the wine chemistry rather than the closure itself. Uh, it is a combination of the two, but the wine chemistry and particularly whether this, um, what trace metals are present in that wine will have an impact. So I, I can't really answer that question directly. There are a number of factors at play, but over a long storage period and assuming good bottling practice, you shouldn't need too much SO2 for a premium red on the screw cap. Uh, he's, Sean's got back to me again and just said, what is the industry practice in Australia? Um, as he's based in New Zealand. I don't think the industry practices really differ that much between the two countries, Sean. Um, and there is no direct recommendation. Um, we would suggest potentially trialling different SO2 levels just to see how the wines develop. There is really no other way to get a good solid 
a solid understanding of how the wine would develop with different SO2 levels. Another question from Jeff Broadfield, are products containing glutathione effective in protecting white wine? And is there any research into adding these compounds in a form that's suitable closer to bottling? Um, some of the studies I've seen have shown some effectiveness with glutathione, but I must admit it's not an area where I'm particularly um, I'm particularly across at this stage. I can ask the question of uh, a couple of colleagues back at the IWRI and get back to you with any relevant material that we're aware of in that in that space. Okay, I'll just give it another minute or two for people to ask any more questions. Okay, if no one has anything else, then I'll wrap up here. I'd like to thank you all for your time and attention this morning. As I said a couple of times during the presentation, if anyone has any particular questions, um, particularly anything that I didn't get a chance to answer during the presentation, please feel free to email me at the AWRI and um, I'll get back to you individually on those. I will. Um, I will get back to you, Jeff, about the question around glutathione, but if anyone else has anything from today's presentation, please feel free to contact me. Um, as always, you can connect with the AWRI through Twitter, or you can email information services um, if you have um, any questions or um, need to request any general information from us. So thank you again, and good morning.